time. And the right time is now. In the light of the fact that last week we visited all these institutions of the world's great religions. And as we were going from place to place, from the Hindu temple to the Muslim mosque to the Sikh temple to the Jewish synagogue, I found it necessary at this time to prepare this series. The series is entitled Discernment, The Real Thing. And for the next several weeks, that's exactly what we're going to be learning to do. Discern truth from error. So let me introduce it to you. What is the real thing? How can we know true Christianity? Is it true that denominations are just different expressions of the same truth and therefore brothers and sisters worshiping the same Jesus with different colors? Some of you come from Catholic backgrounds. I come from an Orthodox background. We have former Lutherans, Anglicans, United Pentecostals. For many of us, our relatives still attend these churches and because we were brought up in them, we feel an emotional tie to these churches and a loyalty to them. We attempt to build bridges and perhaps maintain some kind of contact with the old denominations. After all, aren't we all Christians? But we've got to answer some questions as we do this. Can one be born again by the Spirit of God and know Jesus as personal Savior and still remain a Catholic or an Orthodox? That's one question I want to answer and it's very personal because that is exactly the situation that my beloved sisters are in. How is their spiritual status with Jesus affected? Should they pray to the saints, do the sign of the cross, or pay homage to Mary? Can one lift their hands to Jesus in worship in a Pentecostal church, and then with the same conviction pray the rosary, or attend Mass, or participate in the Eucharist? Is the Eucharist the same as the communion that we observe every month? I'm going to answer all those questions. What about spiritual manifestations like tongues, prophecy, falling down under the power, laughing and trembling and weeping? How do I know what is from God and what is not from God? I'm going to answer that question in the next few weeks. Is it true that witchcraft and paganism has infiltrated the church of Jesus Christ? And how can I detect it? You're going to find out. What about pastors and ministers? How can I tell who is real and how can I tell who is a fraud? And last but not least, how can I know that I am in the truth and that my experience with Jesus is real? Because pastor, over the years I've picked up a lot of information and practices and I want to know what is right, what is wrong, what is biblical and what is unbiblical. Is what I believe really from God? Am I worshiping the true Jesus or another Jesus which the Bible condemns? And how can I know the difference? What about all these new movements and churches that have been rising on the scene? How can I discern which are preaching the truth and which are distortions and heresies? You may ask, why is this important? How many have heard the expression, what you don't know won't hurt you? Would you raise your hand? Many of us have heard that expression, but I want to tell you that it's a blatant lie. What you, do know, what you don't know can and will hurt you. What you don't know could mean the difference between life and death, salvation and condemnation, the Holy Spirit and false spirits, darkness and light, and heaven and hell. What you don't know can hurt you. We live in an age where spirituality is very popular, but we also live in a postmodern age where everything is acceptable and good. And what you believe is based on what you feel, what you personally have observed, your own speculations and conclusions. And the most important precept of the modern age is that there are no absolutes, there is no one way to God, there is no authoritative revelation and that any person who makes definitive statements 
about who God is, what is his nature, who is man, what is his relationship with God, and how one must worship are rejected. That person is rejected. And if Pilate were alive today and asked what is truth, the answer would be, truth is whatever you want it to be. And if there is no truth that you can find that suits you, then make up your own truth or reject the idea of truth altogether. So let's begin the process of learning how to discern. It's become necessary. I had an experience at a wedding last week that perfectly illustrates the very first point I'm going to make. Danny T and I were sitting at the table together and we both ordered Cokes. He ordered a regular Coke and I ordered a Diet Coke. Now look, I've been drinking Diet Coke for the last three decades, ever since Whitney Houston sang about it before she got famous. That's how long I've been drinking the thing. And I can instantly tell the difference between a Diet Coke and a regular Coke, a Coke once I've tasted it. In fact, I've sent Shamar back to the concession stands many times when the counter clerk made a mistake and gave me a regular Coke with the first sip I would know, hey, this is not a Diet Coke, this is a regular Coke. Take this back and tell her it'll kill me. I'll take something that's even more dangerous, full of aspartame, okay. So they brought us two Cokes. But Danny T has a talent that I don't have. He has a knowledge that I don't have. I can tell the difference between Diet Coke and regular Coke by tasting it. He can tell the difference by just looking at it. So he looks at the two Cokes that are on the table and he says, Pastor, yeah, that's not a Diet Coke. What? What do you mean it's not a Diet Coke? He says, not a Diet Coke, it's a regular Coke. So of course, what do you think I did? I picked it up and I tasted it. Oh man, oh, right away, my, 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 my familiarity with Diet Coke kicked in and I knew this was a regular Coke, he was right. And I asked him the question, the ultimate question, how in the world did you know that that was not a Diet Coke? He says, the color of Diet Coke is different. It's lighter. You're kidding, lighter? Had to find out right away. Bring me a Diet Coke. Sure enough, he brings me a Diet Coke. And it was amazing. The Diet Coke was lighter than the regular Coke. I wanted to make sure it was diet. So I tasted it. Yeah, that's a Diet Coke. Amazing. Danny T has taught me something. No, no, it's not amazing that you taught me something. What you taught me is amazing. I wanted to clarify that. Diet Coke is lighter than regular Coke, and when you hold the two together in clear glasses, you can easily distinguish the difference. Well, when they train people to spot counterfeit bills or checks, they train them for months on the characteristics of a real check, of real money, and eventually they become so familiar with it that they can easily discern phony money. That's the reason why I can determine the difference between Diet Coke, which for me is the real thing, and real Coke, which is poison. I, I've been so accustomed to drinking Diet Coke that I immediately know a different taste when I, when, I, when I taste one. So any series on discernment has to begin with examining the real thing so that the falsehood can be spotted with ease. The Bible encourages us to know Jesus in his reality. He can be known in his reality. And it writes, taste and see that the Lord is good. And the Apostle John developed this idea about knowing Jesus when he wrote in the passage that I gave you, 1 John chapter 1 beginning at verse 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us, 
And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. And this is what is very important. Beloved, do not believe every spirit. But test the spirits, whether they be of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and is now already in the world. You are of God, little children, and you have overcome them. Because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world. Therefore they speak as the world, and the world hears them. But we are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Now th these passages of scripture are really profound. So let's set them in order. In an order that will benefit us this morning. First of all, John professes to know the word of life. And we can assume from the confidence with which he writes that there is only one word of life, not two, not ten, not ten thousand, but one. And the word of life was made known to him, listen carefully now, by revelation, it was revealed to him and backed up with unmistakable evidence and signs and wonders. But take note of the evidence. The evidence is not lightning in the sky, misty apparitions, the mystical whining of a deluded man-man, scrolls provided by an angel claiming to speak for God, oral traditions that are never questioned or examined. No, John has seen the truth. He has handled the truth. He has heard the truth spoken. He has experienced the life that comes from it. It is tangible and it is real. And if it is tangible and real, it can be examined. It can be backed up with measurable evidence. And in John's time, the evidence, the measurable, tangible evidence, was the person of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. You knew that what he was saying was true about himself because you saw with your own eyes and John was an eyewitness of Jesus who rose from the dead. He saw him in his resurrected state. And so putting everything together that he had seen and heard and everything that he had been trained to believe as a faithful Jew, he came to the conclusion that he writes in his epistle. But if you look very closely at the text and the way he lays it out, there's a very strong implication here. Very strong. And it, and it, it packs impact for you and me. You can know Jesus as well. You can see him. You can touch him. You can experience him. You too can be a witness just like John was. And although he is not here physically as he was when the Apostle John wrote this, he can be known. He can be known through his spirit. But not subjectively. That's very important. Jesus can be known spiritually, but not subjectively, which means you will not know him through a manifestation by your feelings. He won't come to you by mystical means, through meditation, chanting, mindless repetition of a mantra, an incantation, or a spell. He, he will not come to you after months of self-imposed suffering, the denial of food, or staring into space until you reach a zombified state, or working up your emotions through music, or achieving an altered state such as falling into a trance. How does the living Christ reveal himself? He will reveal himself through his word. 
His word will define him. His word will reveal him. He will come to you on the basis of his word. And beyond his word, that is beyond the simple reading of print on paper, once you've understood and absorbed his word and realized who he is, he will make himself real to you. And I am a witness. He has made himself real to me. I know he is alive. Just That has been his pattern from day one. That's been his pattern since Jesus was born in Bethlehem in a manger. Let me prove it to you by reading the Gospel of John chapter 1. You'll see the pattern that Jesus uses to reveal himself and he's been using the same method ever since. In the beginning was the Word, that's Jesus. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him nothing was made that was made. In him is life and the life is the light of men. The light shines into the darkness and the darkness does not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. That's John the Baptist. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He, that is John, was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light and that is the true life, the light which gives light to every man coming in the world. So there's always a proclamation of the word, always before Jesus appears. He was in the world, but the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. Not everyone who hears the word will believe. And those who do not believe can never know that Jesus is real because the word is preached first and then he manifests his reality to those who receive the word. So the world did not hope, know him. He came to his own people of Israel, but they did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name, who are born not of blood, or of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word, that is Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This is he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, because he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth come through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time, but the only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Jesus is the Word, and He can be known in His reality through the Word. That is where you will find the real Jesus. And so the more you know the Word, the more it will be easy, easy to discern a false Jesus if He happens to be presented to you. Now please pay close attention to what is said by the Apostle Philip in that same chapter, John chapter 1, 43. This is when he first meets Jesus. Watch, watch what happens here. It's amazing. The following day, Jesus went to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. You could bypass that scripture and not get the impact of it, but here it is. This sheds a lot of light on how the disciples came to believe that Jesus was God in the flesh, the Savior of the world, the Messiah of Israel. They did not conclude this by being wowed through his miracles. If you remember correctly, they spent three and a half years watching him work miracles, but they all deserted him when he went to the cross. It wasn't the miracles. Nor did they come to this conclusion on their own. After all, they were Jews, and they would emphatically deny all Jesus claimed to be God, no matter how strongly he would assert them. But they had a word. They had the word of God, specifically. Moses and the prophets, which make up the Old Testament. And those clearly testify what the Messiah would be, 
and what he would do when he came. So on the basis of the word that they already knew, they came to the conclusion that Jesus was the Messiah sent by God. That is what Philip is saying in that verse. Now mind you, they were correct. But they were a bit hasty and superficial in their conclusion. Jesus said he saw Nathanael sitting under the fig tree, resting himself, that he wasn't present, but on that basis Nathanael said, oh, you are the Messiah, the Christ of God. But Jesus will never allow you to come to a conclusion superficially. He'll want to add depth to that revelation. Superficial revelations have a way of dying. And so this is what he does with his disciples. Jesus takes care of the fact that these guys had reached the right conclusion, but superficially. That's not enough for Jesus. It's got to go deeper than that. So every aspect of his life would be and could be cross-referenced with what the Word of God stated. Every miracle that he would do would line up with what the prophets wrote the Messiah would do. They even wrote about the way he would teach, that he would speak in parables. And note that they did not immediately conclude that he was God. Okay, well, we understand that, but we don't understand the full extent of who Jesus is. If this was a fairy tale that had been made up of a man, this would not read in this way. They would never admit that it took them years to come to believe that Jesus is who he says he is. That's significant. That takes the legend out of it. I'm not finished. After he rose from the dead, did they believe then? Not all of them. Jesus would have to sit down and lead them through the scriptures to show them everything that was written about him in the Old Testament and connected with his death and resurrection. So some astonishing statements are made in the word of God surrounding that event. And the first one comes in Matthew 28, 16. So listen, listen to this. The eleven disciples went away to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. He's risen from the dead. And some doubted. Now that's amazing. In Mark 16, chapter 14, it says, Later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table, and he rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. In Luke 24, 44, he says, Then he said to them, These words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. This is the bombshell scripture right here. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Is that necessary when you have the risen Christ standing in front of you? Does he have to work a supernatural act in your heart to believe what the scripture says when the tangible evidence is standing and living in front of you? That's the question. If it were a legend, it wouldn't read this way. Verse 46 says, Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the, first, the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And we all know that that's the power of the Holy Spirit that came upon them. So here's the, the, the mind-bending truth that even with the resurrected Jesus standing in front of them, they still didn't know who he was and why all this had happened to him. It was the word of God that revealed the truth and the reality. And this in cooperation with the work of the Holy Spirit which opened up their understanding and their minds, finally convinced, convinced them, 
and they were able to make their unshakable confession in writing. So the bottom line is, no one can conclude that Jesus is who the Bible says he is without an intervention of the Holy Spirit. And you thought you were saved because of your great intelligence or because of your great wisdom or because you saw something that nobody else saw. No. It was an intervention of the Holy Spirit that opened up your understanding to receive the word and then Jesus made himself real to you. It was all a work of God. John chapter 20 verse 30 then starts the series of confessions and I'm not going to read them all. He is now finally convinced. It's amazing. The disciples see him risen from the dead. The Spirit of God does his work. Jesus leads them through the scriptures and finally they get convinced and they write. Truly Jesus did other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God and that believing you have life in his name. Peter the Apostle writes in 1 Peter 1, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Took him three and a half years to come to that conclusion. And then in 1 John 5, 19 to 20, the apostle writes, We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies in the evil one. We know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Again, you can see that the means that God uses to convince people of the truth to this day, to this day. First, there is a revelation through the Word of God. The Word of God is proclaimed. Then the Holy Spirit does His work and opens up your understanding so that you can receive the Word in faith. And then Jesus makes Himself real to you. And it's always been that way from day one. And so the cornerstone of truth is the Word of God. All religions, all opinions, all philosophies, all conjectures, all positions, all denominational statements are measured up against the Word of God. Because only there, only here in the Word of God will you know for certain who Jesus really is and how you can get to know Him intimately. And that's why the Apostle Paul was completely intolerant of any Jesus that did not measure up to what the Bible says about him. Any Jesus that was outside the word of God, he rejected. So he wrote in Galatians chapter 1, beginning at verse 6, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you, then what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than that which you have received, let him be accursed. And then in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3, he says, I fear lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, and so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, if you receive a different spirit which you have not received or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. Now these statements are crucial in our lessons on discernment. You want to know why? Because Paul says the gospel will be perverted. This is going to happen. The gospel will be perverted. Number two, he says, perverted gospels are coming. In fact, John says they're even amongst us right now. They didn't wait for the last apostle to die. The falsehoods about Jesus started immediately. Paul also makes clear that angels and men will come preaching another Jesus. They will offer another spirit. They will preach another gospel and they will be inspired by the same one who tempted Eve in the garden, Satan the devil. They will be inspired by Satan. 
and you will be tempted to put up with it. That is, many will be drawn in. But for you, don't put up with it. Resist it, reject it, and proclaim the truth in its stead. For you are on solid ground, and when you make pro proclamation to somebody, don't just debate with them. Debating is a waste of time. Open up the Word of God and back up your claims by Scripture. Now, it didn't take long for the falsehoods to come, as I said. In John chapter 4, he's dealing with one of them already. And it was the heresy that Jesus was not fully man, not really man, but appeared as a man and borrowed a body which he later discarded. That's what was being taught by a group of people called the Gnostics. And so John challenged them and said, no, Jesus Christ came fully God, fully man. He was a human being like you and me. He was born through a mother, through the Virgin Mary, like you and me, lived like you and me, hunger, thirsted, was affected by the human condition in every way, died a real death and rose from the dead bodily. And he's still bodily seated at the right hand of God right now. So this teaching of him not taking on a real body because somehow the body is corrupt and God would never take upon himself a real body is a falsehood. Now what difference does it make? What's the difference if somebody believes Jesus was fully man or fully God or partially man or partially God or, or a prophet or an example to us or a created being? What, what difference does it make? Let's deal with what John was dealing with. Because we're going to deal with all of these things as the weeks go by. It means that he was not a true man. And if he is not a true man then he cannot be a representative man. And if he can't be a representative man before God, then he can't take your sins upon himself. Because he's not like you. If he's not God in the flesh, then his blood is the blood of a mere man. And what good will that do? Nothing. But because he is fully man and fully God, his blood has power. And it has precious value. And see, so because he is who he says he is, his blood brings you absolute atonement for your sins and forgiveness for every man, woman, past, present, and future with every drop. And that's the difference that it makes. Every heresy, every false religion, every false practice, every unbiblical teaching and habit, and every denomination has them, which you're going to find out in the next five weeks. Comes from watering Jesus down. When Jesus is watered down, another Jesus is put in his place. The gospel is weakened and the power of the Holy Spirit is gone. The Holy Spirit will only work and make himself real when the real Jesus is preached. When a substitute or false Jesus is presented, the Spirit of God wants nothing to do with it. This in summary is the reason why the Christian church as a whole over the last 2,000 years has experienced highs of power and lows of weakness throughout its history to this present day. What you do with Jesus and what you do with the clear teaching of the Word of God has an effect on the power that you experience. And if it is a false Jesus, you experience no power at all. This is not the Jesus of the Bible. This is the Jesus of tradition. This is the Jesus of human speculation. This is the Jesus of misquoted scripture, misinterpreted scripture. There is no power in that. So when a false Jesus is presented, the power for forgiveness is gone. And you spend all of your life serving a Jesus, never knowing if you've done enough for him to forgive you. When you serve up a false Jesus, the power of the resurrection is gone from your life and your circumstances overwhelm you, so much so that you can't tell the difference between somebody of faith 
and somebody not of faith, they have the same problems, they have the same hassles, they deal with them in the same way and they are brought down just as destructively because there is no power of the resurrection present. The power of intimacy with God is gone. He always seems far away and unreachable. The power of, an, of answered prayer and the intervention of God is gone because you are not praying to the true God, you are praying to a false God. Even though he may have Christian clothes on, if he's not the biblical Jesus, there is no answered prayer. You are praying to nothing. The power of grace and the love of God is gone and he becomes inaccessible, beyond reach, impossible to find because the truth has been discarded for lies and deception and when that happens all the people suffer. What is the truth about Jesus? That's a good question. But there is another question that must be asked along with it or the first question cannot be answered. What is the truth about Jesus? Well put. But who has the authority to answer that question? Does the Muslim? Does the Hindu? Does the Buddhist? Of course not. Those who have the authority to answer that question are the eyewitnesses of Jesus' life. Those who live with him, those who observed him for three and a half years, they are the writers of the New Testament, every one of which saw him alive after his death, or in two cases, was directly connected to someone who was. And last but not least, the Hebrew Scriptures have the authority to answer that question, because in every single book, from Genesis to Malachi, something about Jesus is revealed. Every book. That's why when Jesus came, people like the Apostle Paul were able to look back at Hebrew Scripture and realize this is the one that the Scriptures were talking about. And we can do the same. We can do the same. The truth about Jesus comes from his own house, not from the house of unbelievers and skeptics. I don't care what atheists say about him. I don't care what other religions say about him. I want to know what he says about himself and what those who saw him alive say about him. And that is what has changed my life. The truth about Jesus comes out of his own house. And that's why for 500 years, the body of Christ wrestled with the issues so that they could come up with definite statements of the truth of Jesus. Who is he? What is his nature? What is his mission? How can we know him? 500 years, they wrestled with those questions because the answer to those questions are crucial to all of us. Where do they get their information? From the guru, from the imam, 400, uh, another 300 years before he exists, from the grand master living Buddha, from the druid, from the shaman priest, from the pagan prophets who chirped and wailed on and on appeasing their angry gods with rituals and ceremonies, incantations, superstitions, offerings, repetitive prayers, from the hundreds of false gospels that were written by mystics that contradicted the testimony of the apostles who, and, and those were written long after the New Testament was completed. No. They got their information from the Word of God. From what the Spirit of God had done in them as a result of the Word of God. They got their answers from Scripture. And so here they are, 350 men, sitting in the city of Nicaea. Most of them are scarred and mangled and missing arms and legs because of the persecution that they experienced from the Romans. Because they believed Jesus is who he says he is. They're sitting there and now the persecution is over. And many hundreds of th and thousands of their comrades have been put to death. Over, over 345 years, thousands upon thousands of believers were put to death. 
butchered, fed to animals, run through by gladiators, burned alive because they believe Jesus is who he says he is and these guys remained. They are at a council called by the Emperor Constantine who has asked them to come up with a definitive statement about what Christianity is all about. Because there was a lot of things being said and a lot of teachings whirling around and he wanted the definitive one. Now other religions and even you yourself sitting here may criticize their conclusions. You may say, how can you suggest that God is three persons and one God? How dare you say that Jesus is equal to God? What pertinence are you displaying to suggest that God became a man to die for the sins of the world on our behalf and that he rose according to the Hebrew scriptures? What possesses you to proclaim that there is a Holy Spirit who is equally God and gives life to us by his indwelling presence? Brothers and sisters, these truths were not made on the spot. They were not invented by the emperor or conceived through a conspiracy to snuff out others, other ideas of Jesus. What, no world motive. What, what kind of motive would do that? It's, it's modern nonsense. In fact, the council dealt with one of those who suggested that Jesus is not God, but a created being. A bishop by the name of Arius presented that lie, and he was firmly corrected by the council. But his beliefs are still being spread today by the Jehovah Witnesses. Not one of the doctrines that I've mentioned was casually written down and glibly accepted by everyone. All of them were painstakingly arrived at through careful, meticulous study of the Word of God, which by that time was complete, well-known, and accepted. And it is the same word that we hold in our hands today. Exactly the same. Here's what they wrote. Of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of life, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man. He was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate, he suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven. And he sits on the right hand of God. He shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke through the prophets. We believe in one Catholic, that means united, doesn't mean Roman Catholic, an apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Now, although this creed, the Nicene Creed, is the most famous, it's not the first one. There were others before. I want to read them to you. These creeds were written, some of them five to six years after the resurrection of Jesus. There is a creed in 1 Corinthians 8, 6. Yet there is one God the Father, from whom all things and for whom all things we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ through whom all things and through whom we exist. That's a creed an early creed of the church, included in the scriptures. Another creed, 1 Corinthians 12, 3, Therefore I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is cursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord 
except by the Holy Spirit. In other words, no one can come to saving faith except the Holy Spirit reveal it to him. 1 Corinthians 15, 3-7, another creed, written 10 years after the resurrection. I delivered to you of a, of a first importance also which, that which I received, that Jesus died for our sins according with, to the scriptures, and he was buried. He was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He appeared to Cephas, that is Peter, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles, and then finally Paul says to me. Philippians 2, 6 to 11, another creed. Who, let this mind be in you who was also in Christ Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of, a man, of men, being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. 1 Timothy 3.16, a creed written five years after the resurrection. Great indeed we confess is the mystery of our religion. He was manifest in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, preached amongst the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. And after that, in A.D. 100, Hippolytus, a Christian pastor, wrote the form of baptism. I want you to listen to it very carefully. Here's what he writes. When a person being baptized goes down into the water, he who baptizes him shall say, Do you believe in God the Father Almighty? Then he shall say, Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who was born of the Virgin Mary and crucified under Pontius Pilate, was dead, buried, and rose on the third day, alive from the dead, ascended into heaven, has sat at the right hand of God, and has come to, and will come again to judge the living and the dead? He will say, Yes, I believe. And finally he will ask, Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Church, in the resurrection of the body? Upon saying yes, the person then shall be baptized into the church of Jesus Christ. Interesting, isn't it? I'd like to ask some of you that grew up in the mainline traditions, how can a baby answer those questions? Then after that, in A.D. 150, 50 years after the death of the Apostle John, Irenaeus writes, This is our faith, one God, the Father Almighty, who made the heaven and the earth, the seas, and all that are in them, and one Jesus Christ, Son of God, who was made flesh for our salvation, and in the Holy Spirit, who, was, who made known through the prophets the plan of salvation, the coming and the birth from a virgin, and the passion and the resurrection from the dead, and the bodily ascension into heaven of our beloved Lord Christ Jesus, and his future appearing from heaven in the glory of the Father to sum up all things and to raise in you all flesh from the whole human race. And then after that, the Apostles' Creed, which tradition says was written 10 years after the resurrection of Jesus. In actuality, in truth, it was not written 10 years after the resurrection, but all of the statements that are made in the Apostles' Creed had already been spoken by the Apostles and somebody took pieces of them and put them together and wrote this creed. So every statement comes out of the mouth of, the, of an Apostle. And that's why they call it the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to, to, the, to hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy United Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. 
And this is what they professed for 300 years. They went to their deaths professing that. And as a result of their faith, and as a result of their persistence and their loyalty to the Word of God, nothing of what they have said has changed. It still stands to this day in every Christian denomination. Every Christian denomination believes what I have just read. Every single one. Who for our salvation was made man? How is that salvation received? We will discuss that next week. Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and mine, past, present, and future. He rose from the dead to indicate to his followers that he was God, that his death was sufficient for the forgiveness of sin, and he sent the Holy Spirit to indwell every one of them to go and proclaim the message of forgiveness of sin and unity with God, the true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through him. Every Christian denomination believes that. But they differ as to how to apply it. And next week, we're going to discern and we're going to examine every one of them to see what the truth about receiving salvation is. Would you stand?